Hi, I'm Wack. Hi, I'm Pat, and welcome to another edition of the Weekly Orbit, the week ending Friday, November 3rd. Uh, Wack, where does this podcast find you today? <laughs> I'm not in the same room I've been in the last few weeks, so it's not, it's not too different uh, a scenery. <laughs> Did, um, do you know what today is? Today is the one year anniversary of FTX collapsing pretty much. Yes, and it's the it's day one after SBF has been convicted on all counts uh, by a jury in New York City mm -hmm. for all the shenanigans. And I think it's a just as in general, it's a good day for crypto that we're putting folks like him. You know, there being um, there's consequences for the disaster that people like him caused. He's the biggest one, but you know, there's a lot of others who are who've been tracked down and are sitting in prison cells waiting to be extradited or waiting to have their day in court too. So I think it's good. I don't know what you, just real quick, your thoughts on SPF. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I think I followed the trial like closely and fairly closely at different parts along the, along the way. And um, I think for those who were kind of following along knew that he was going to get hit hard. And when he decided to take the stand himself, that was, that was the point where we just knew that it was over for him pretty much. So, That's a Hail Mary. Yeah. I, I was, I've listened to a couple of legal podcasts on the side and generally the, the um, rule is never take the stand. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and in this case, if they do, then it's kind of a sign that things are not going well and yeah. you're just going to, Hey, what do you got to lose at this point? Right. You just need to get one juror who gets, who gets undecided and then you get a hung jury and you live for another day. The, the funny thing is that like his trial performance was so bad that like I didn't even know what he was thinking. It just it was atrocious. Like he he was like one of those overconfident kids who thinks they can just kind of like win the presentation on the day off, and this literally had years of his life riding on this. And yeah. he he was a gambler to the end, you know, like taking risks to the end. And they, they caught up with him last year, and they're catching up with him again now. So yeah. yeah. So do you want to guess? His, his uh, I saw his sentencing is scheduled for March twenty eighth. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to take a guess on how many years he's going to get? Yeah, I think he'll probably end up with somewhere around like 30 to 50 years. But that's just like based on, you know, the analysis of other people. Um, I'm not, it's been a long time since I, I was in the legal environment, like a lifetime ago, pretty much. But um, with that in mind, like I think it'll be a fairly substantial chunk. Because it's a federal court, there's a minimum amount that you'll have to serve. And then of course, you know, it depends where he's going to serve it. He's not going to go to like... Rikers or anything like that. He'll be in a minimum security prison, most likely, and playing tennis on the weekends. Maybe. Well, I t I met a guy once who this is a long time ago, back in the nineties. I was at this party down in um, near South Carolina, and he had just gotten out of minimum security prison. I said, "Oh, well, what did you get? What did you go to prison for?" He said, "Well, I like I, I like to blow things up, and I used to blow up like pop cans." Okay. And then one day I put one of my homemade little bombs inside of a, a post office box outside the federal building in downtown Atlanta. <laughs> and so he did some time, minimum security, but he said it was completely awful. Um, he never, ever wants to go back. It was a terrible experience. And he sounded like he had learned a lesson or two. So it doesn't sound like it's a, you know, minimum security is still, it kind of sucks. It's still prison. From, <laughs> yeah. It's still prison. Yeah. And uh, the guards, they mess with your head. And he told me all kinds of stories. But yeah. um, I'm going to say 20 years. Uh, and I wonder if Vegas has some odds. I'm sure they do. Someone's, you can you bet on these things. Chain. Instead of going to Vegas, you'll get the poly market yeah. sort of bring up any day now. I'm sure about how long he's going to get. So I would say, yeah, I'll say 20. I'll say 20 because he's a young man. He's in his early 30s. Uh, it's easy for a judge to send someone like Madoff who was... He was like 70, I think, at the time to prison for the, uh, you know, I'm going to give you 50 years knowing that the guy's going to die in the next 15 years about. Uh, whereas he's a young man, I say 20, he didn't kill anybody. They're, violent crime is always treated worse than uh, white collar crime or in case of uh, SBF, no collar. You know, he's had T-shirts on. But that, that's, uh, that's much of my quick opinion on, on it. We'll see. Um, he's going to face some... Tough years, though, for sure, no matter what. Absolutely. Okay. In, now, if we go on to uh, 
let's talk about Rockapool stuff. Um, okay. So let's talk about some stats first, WAC. Uh, that we'll start quickly with the deposit pool. We're at, we're overflowing uh, right now. Mm -hmm. The max is 18,000. We're at 23,895. And so it's, for our listeners, how is it possible we can go over the max limit on the deposit pool? Yeah, it's because when people exit a validator, there's two parts of that ETH, right? There's the ETH that belongs to them, and there's the ETH that belongs to the protocol. And the ETH that belongs to them, they're, they're able to take that back for themselves, whether there's 8 ETH per validator or 16 ETH per validator. Then the question becomes, what happens to the other 16 ETH? That other 16 ETH or 24 ETH gets put onto the deposit pool. There's a buffer of like overflow, and once that gets full, then it starts going onto the deposit pool. So what happened here was that there was a big... There was a big person, a whale, who um, exited their stake, and um, that added seven or eight thousand ETH onto the deposit pool. Um, so now it's sat, you know, nearly six thousand above. So it's come come down by a couple of thousand, but it's still way above eighteen thousand. Yeah, as we're sitting here, I notice it's it's um, been updating. It's going down. It looks like there's a whale creating mm -hmm. some mini pools as we speak. So X, yeah. well, there goes another one. Um, so that that's imp it's going to take a while then to get this down uh, back to eighteen thousand or below. Mm -hmm. Maybe a week or maybe even longer, depending on how things are going, because there's no way to arb this um, at the moment. There's n the rocket arb is not available because the deposit pool is over full. So it's just people who don't care about that who are who are minting um, or starting validators, I should say, and um, it's just that they'll have to just accept that they're not going to get any kind of or uh, premium or anything like that, they'll, they'll be able to get access to. So um, maybe, you know, Thomas was saying that he might start some new validators this weekend. And you can see here that 1KX are starting validators. Well, then we need a whole bunch of validators to get back to 18,000. Right. Well, I, th I think we were, at first it was like about twenty five or 26,000, as I recall, mm -hmm. last week. And we're down to 23 and change now. So yeah. we're heading there. Okay, on to let's take a look, quick look at prices. Um, I've got Lido uh, LDO price this week. Looks like um, over the last seven days, according to CoinGecko, it's up 1.6% in US dollar terms. Um, and then we've got Rocket Pool RPL. So we started at 0 0.0134, and we are currently at. 0 0.0128, so down just a touch. Mm -hmm. um, what's your take on RPL price this week? I think you know we we retraced a chunk of that pump that we had last week, um, and now it's just a matter of um, seeing what happens in the coming days. Thankfully, we have a bit more liquidity on the sell side, so hopefully you know the prices won't go down. Well, if they do go down, they'll they'll go down a little bit more slowly, but. Um, because they just need that much more RPL to get through the, the walls. But this is pretty much a flat week for Rocket Pool. I think um, for for RPL, I think once, uh, you know, Bitcoin and ETH kind of decide a direction, then the RPL token will just get pulled along with that, like whether that's up or down. So we'll have to yeah. just keep an eye out on that movement. It seems like uh, these traders who have a much more better grasp on the markets than I do generally... BTC leads the way in a bull market, and you got that narrative starting to build about ETF. And then ETH then follows, and then the alt follow behind ETH as it kind of trickles down throughout the market. And so we're it's expected that um, you know ETH and RPL will trail BTC in the in the short run. That seems to be the consensus, um, at least until the ETF comes out, and then we'll see. Okay, moving on. We've got, uh, we're going to spend some time talking about the votes. There's four votes pending right now. Um, in order, we've got the budget. Then we have deposits under the minimum. We then have RPL staking rework. And then GMC membership selection. All right, so let's, talk, let's take a look at these individually. Um, I've got a link in the show notes. If you haven't voted yet for... The GMC members, uh, please do. There's nine that need to be selected. And this page has 
the statements from each person who's been nominated. So, you, you know, I encourage everyone to go out and look and read uh, what each nominee has to say. Um, with the GMC WAC, when you're voting, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can vote for nine people across, or you can put all your votes into one person, or you can spread it out. As I recall, you can select one, two, three, four, five. You want to you say, hey, you know what? I really love this person. I'm going to give them all my votes. Or you can spread it out. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. So there are 11 people who have been nominated for nine spots. So then the other two will become kind of like backups or extras if any of the first nine um, have to leave uh, for some reason or can't fulfill their duties. And then what happens is that we have um, any people can vote um, however they want according to those nine people. I think there's four or f sorry, five returning members. There's me, Ken, Joe, um, Dondo and RPL Maxi who are five people who served before and have decided to come back and then we've got six new people who are put their hats in the ring um, and of those we um, have um, you know people like um, Looking for Owls and Dr. Doofus, Epinef, Rocknet, uh, Destroyer and Feeling Good, Feeling Great and you can vote for all of those if you want with different weights you can put all your weights to vote on one person you can divide your weight out equally um, it just depends on how you feel like you want to vote so uh, that is definitely an option for you to go and do that and you 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 get that information so yeah it's it's uh, it's i definitely encourage everyone to go vote um even if you're not sure like who to vote for at that point you can just vote equally for everyone because this vote still isn't quite at quorum yet and uh, we just want to make sure that, you know, we hit quorum, so uh, we don't have to do this again. <laughs> right, yeah, we're at 7,000. We need 7,400 for quorum. So we're yeah. just below it. So if you haven't, you haven't, is this open for about another week or so? That's right, yeah, it's still open for another week. So I'm not too mm -hmm. worried about um, about it not um, hitting quorum. Like, we just need Joe to vote, and then it'll be well over quorum. He hasn't voted yet. I think he's going to vote this weekend. So once that happens, then you know, there's not too much of a worry about it not hitting quorum. But um, I'd encourage everyone to go and read the statements and then go ahead and vote based on that. Yeah, if you're ever concerned about what kind of money that Rockapool is putting out in grants and bounties, this is where you want to focus on those nominees and make sure the money is best spent in the way you think it should be. Uh, it's for budget updates. So this is the budget. This is for the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Well, no, it's not quite for the next 12 months. So as you all know that, you know, we um, had a vote a few months ago about the ODAO taking a pay cut and that money coming to the PDAO instead. So this vote is to fix some issues around that vote that happened because the GMC and the IMC missed out on the payment each pretty much. Um, so it's just to get them back to where they were supposed to be with that payment. But then also it's coming up with a new split of money so it used to be that you know there'd be a certain amount of money that went to the reserve fund a certain amount of money that went to the imc some certain amount of money that went to the gmc so based on community discussions this is being changed around a little bit so the imc will start getting a little bit more money so we'll be getting 16 percent of inflation um well i think maybe 16 percent more for now and then this will happen again you know in a few months time where things will potentially get reworked again yes. so um, this is quite straightforward. I think, you know, it just makes sense that you'll vote in favor of this because it, um, it's just fixing um, some admin stuff and kind of um, um, bringing um, allocations in line with what the community wants. And for our listeners, what is the, we've talked a lot about the GMC, but what is the IMC and uh, what do they do? Yeah, so the IMC is the Incentives Management Committee and it's their job to make sure that the RETH token has... Um, a sufficient amount of liquidity on the secondary market. So they um, basically give incentives to people to um, deposit their RETH into certain liquidity pools. And then by doing that, they 
um, help keep the price of our ETH kind of where we want it to be, which is like a peg with ETH, depending on, you know, um, how value is accruing to that. So the IMC has like lots of different strategies that they fund and they work on um, building those relationships so they can um, have really good um, depth for our ETH. And the metric that they use is like how much our ETH does a person have to sell to move the price by 1%. That's kind of like their go-to and they want that to be as much as possible because having a deep liquidity uh, really helps support um, the trust of the the public, basically the people in the value of the RE token. Gotcha. All right. So that explains the budget proposal. Let's take a look at the next vote we, we've got. And that's deposits under the minimum. Mm -hmm. um, so the TLDR on this is if you... If your node was, say, at 9% collateral in RPL and you wanted to spin up another mini pool, um, under the current regime, eight, say you're doing an 8 ETH mini pool, you'd have to come up with 2.4 ETH worth of RPL plus additional RPL to get you from 9% to 10. Mm -hmm. And this proposal says... Well, you're just going to need to come up with that 2.4. Don't worry. If you've fallen, if the rest of the node is below 10%, don't worry about that. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. So the reason for this vote is actually kind of makes sense because um, if you want to st start up a new validator, this is a roadblock to doing that because you might not want to buy more RPL um, than you must, if that makes sense. Um, and what is possible then is the person can just set up a second node where instead of having one node, and you can have many nodes on one machine, right? So it's not necessarily that you have to buy new hardware. Um, on the same machine that you have, you can just set up a new partition, a new rocket pool, you know, smart node stack with a new um, node on there. And you can just put the 2.4 and get started. So it's kind of a workaround in the sense that people can already do. However, that's a little bit more gas intent intensive because you have to set up a new node and that costs gas. And also it's kind of like one person with many nodes has uh, something called a Sybil effect where you don't, you want one person to be one node pretty much um, except, you know, for other reasons, but not for trying to game the system like this. It's not, it's not beneficial for anyone. So the idea of this proposal then is that, you know, um, that person might just forsake their RPL rewards still for now um, until mm -hmm. the ratio improves, but um, it will let them keep bringing validators online. So, um, it's it's a nice kind of streamlining system that might seem kind of neutral, but there's some benefits along the way that you know you get just by having a better representation of how many nodes there actually are instead of um, having that number kind of be inflated or not um, not understood properly. Gotcha. We've had a, a special guest just uh, arrived. <laughs> she's uh, she's curious about RPL a little too yeah. much right now. Let's put her down. Uh, okay, on to the next the vote. So we talked about the budget, we talked about deposits under the minimum, and now the big boy, RPL staking rework. All right, so this one's a lot more in depth. Um why where can you just what's the TLDR? We've had discussion going back through to the summer. Val has uh, been center on this um RP our pip and They've done a lot of number crunching, a lot of charts I've seen. Um, but for someone who hasn't voted yet and they're considering, uh, what do you, how would you explain this in a, you know, a, a couple minutes? <laughs> yeah, so this is, a, <laughs> this is a huge, huge, huge proposal. And like there's a whole lot of different factors that go into it. But basically the idea is that right now, when you provide RPL collateral, you aren't necessarily using all of that to secure the protocol because there's just too much RPL collateral. So what's happening is the people who wrote this RPIP, Val and others who contributed to it, had this idea that you know you're paying for people to kind of speculate on the RPL token um, and you're just giving them money to do that. And there's not really much need for the protocol to be paying those people to speculate on the token. So that's kind of like the loose idea. So the way this works is instead of you know uh, paying for speculation necessarily, we want to pay the idea is that you know they want to pay for more up our ETH to be created, and by creating more our ETH, you'll give those people more rewards. Now, the idea for that is that you um, 
produce the most RETH when you bring on the maximum number of validators online. So the more validators you bring online, the more this uh, you'll be rewarded under this new staking rework proposal. Now, there are a lot of people who you know are staking RPL, and for some of those people, their rewards will actually go up under this proposal. For some people, their rewards will go down under this proposal. If you are an LEB um, 16, like a mini pool 16 user, um, it's almost definitely the case that you are going to lose rewards. Um, and it, this uh, proposal will strongly encourage you to move to um, LEB, uh, LEB 8. If you are um, LEB 8 node operator, like your majority of the validators are LEB 8, then if you have over 100% collateral of bonded ETH, then you'll start to um, lose out on rewards, basically, um, compared to what you would be getting if you were below that. So that, that's what it kind of comes down to is this idea of like a reward per collateral amount. And the higher your collateral amount is, the lower your reward will be per collateral amount. And that sweet spot will now be 10% to 15% of bonded ETH as RPL collateral. And that's where you'll get the maximum amount of um, reward per collateral amount. And as you move on uh, from that, you know, with LEB 8s, you'll be getting more um, than with um, mini pool 16s. So patches uh, crunch some numbers. And he saw that, you know, for the biggest node operators who are on the LEB 16s, um, what will happen is they'll, some of them might be getting as little as 40% of the rewards they currently get. Like, so that's a big, big, big pay cut. Um, however, with uh, other node operators, they might be getting up to an 80% increase in their in their uh, rewards, which could potentially be hundreds of RPL a month. So there's a lot of discussion going on over here about, you know, what kind of impact this will have on the protocol and uh, like, how will this impact people who are RPL heavy, those mm -hmm. who, you know, who have large amounts of RPL staked, how will this impact people who are RPL light? Will they prefer this? Um, and, you know, there's different ideas of people potentially leaving the protocol because um, they're not happy with like, you know, the reduction in rewards. Or then there's the idea that people will join the protocol because they'll be getting so much more rewards. So there's it's a really fine balancing act between like what what will be the outcome of this. But the main thing is that you need to take away from this is that like if you have more validators, you will get more rewards. And the some of the things that really stuck out to me was like, you know, I really do think that this proposal will attract more node operators because even going in at the minimum, like, you know, the amount of reward you get will be um, a lot higher than than the current system. Um, I think it will very, very strongly encourage node operators to switch to LEB 8s instead of being on 16 ETH validators because um, you'll, you'll either gain a lot more rewards or depending on what your collateral percentage is, you won't lose as much, basically. And then um, the other thing is as well, I think that this will strongly encourage node operators who are under 10% to top up their validators to get above 10% because the amount of rewards that they'll be missing out on is a lot higher than it currently is. So, you know, just using random numbers, you know, like now if they were to get 10 RPL above 10%, then they might get like nearly 20 RPL or maybe even more. So, you know, they might be doubling their rewards by topping up a little bit. So the the analyses change a lot about whether or not you should top up those numbers. So that's kind of the, a rough overview of the vote. Um, and yeah, I'm, I hope I didn't miss out. There's a lot of different factors to it. So I really like strongly encourage you to go and read about it. Uh, there are a couple of like TLDR things, especially the vote text can give you a really high overview of what's included. But um yeah, I, I strongly urge you to go and have a look at that. And I've been urging people to to go and read about it for the last like three or four months. Yeah. But um, thankfully, you know, I think a lot of people have taken the time to go and read about it and try to understand what's happening. And um, hopefully the vote goes smoothly over the next couple of weeks. So. But there's also uh, a change that would allow those who are um, under 150% to withdraw their excess RPL above 15%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that right now, if you're a node operator and you've got um, anywhere from 10 to 150%, you can't withdraw. So this is going mm -hmm. to free up uh, node operators to withdraw. Part of the hope is that that withdrawn RPL will be converted into new mini pools. So you'll swap your RPL for ETH and then come back and um, create more mini pools, which, which will help grow the protocol. Um, there's a 28-day 
wait period that mm-hmm. is um, kind of cooling off period. So I think the idea is that we, you know, as volatile as RPL can be, that you're not going to try to time the market. And, and oh wow, it just RPL just hit point zero four ratio. I'm going to withdraw all of it now. To, this is going to say, well, no, it's going to. You can put that request in, and then 28 day, eight days later, you get your RPL. What's your um, What's your take on how that's going to affect um, node operators? It, it really takes away the, the market timing. Of- yeah, so currently, if you put a new stake um, on Rocket Pool, it, there's a barrier to be able to remove that of 28 days. However, this is going to kind of change it. So there won't be a barrier to remove new stake. However, there will be a barrier to remove existing stake. So the time block kind of just changes around a little bit. And some people are pro-time lock, some people are anti-time lock. Some people think that, you know, this should have happened over a much longer period. The time lock is going to come into place, and sorry, the 15% withdrawal amount is going to come into place over six months. So it'll go down month by month over the next six periods um, until it reaches 15%. So that's something to keep in mind about how you know, the, 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 that's going to change. So it's not like all of the RPL is not going to be, become liquid overnight. It, it'll take a while for it to become liquid. And I think that was, you know, one of the fears that some people had was that it might potentially, like if too many people want to swap their RPL to ETH to start new validators, it'll cause a price dump. <laughs> And yeah. that, that's been a fear, but then people, you know, say that there's not really much evidence of that happening. And there's, you know, you could also present the argument that people will be buying RPL to bring their nodes above 10%. So how that's going to balance out, you know, we don't really know. But um, it'll be interesting to see what the next few months look like in terms of um, moving RPL around and what kind of staking collateral percentages people are going in with. Yeah, absolutely. Take a look at um, Patches. He's done some work. He's created a spreadsheet here. You can click on his uh, link, and it'll take you to the rewards tree. And you can mm-hmm. just do a Control F, search for your node, and I'll show you how much reward you got this period, and then how much you would get under the proposed. Okay, so if you're interested, how is that going to affect me? Then take a look um, with the work that Patches did here, and of mm-hmm. course, take your time, read it. Please vote. This is an important one, and uh, we'll we'll I'm sure we'll be talking about it more. Next week. Uh, yeah. On to our last and final piece. Uh, NodeSet uh, had an announcement this week. Uh, Wanderer posts in the NodeSet Discord. He says, we're thrilled to announce that we are working hard to enable our community to provide validation services for vaults on StakeWise. Okay, this represents the first official opportunity for NodeSet operators to earn more from the partnerships we're developing across the ecosystem. So... There's been a lot of talk about Rocket Pool being part of the Node Set launch. It sounds like Stakewise will be as well. So, from a node operator's perspective, um, it sounds like to me, Wack, that you can you get your Rocket Pool rewards, and then folks will be depositing through Node Set to spin up Rocket Pool uh, validators, but now also Stakewise. So, is it going to work where I'm a Rocket Pool node operator? I'm gonna, I, I'm going to be able to take run validators for both Stakewise and Rocket Pool and yeah. enhance my rewards? That's exactly the idea, yeah. Wow. So to become a, a node operator with node set, there are a couple of criteria that you'll have to hit. One of them is that you know you are uh, you have access to physical hardware to stake, so people on all nodes won't have access to node set. On top of that, you'll have to be a validator for at least six months. Um, so you can't just like spin up a validator and hope to be like a node set validator tomorrow. And the third thing is that you have to maintain a certain level of um, quality of stake, like 95% score according to a rated network. And once you hit all those criteria, then you can apply to be a node set uh, validator. Now, node set are really kind of like doing a really interesting job here where they're building a node operator army pretty much, like a big <laughs> group of node operators that they'll be able to hire out to all the different protocols or services who they think would need node operator services. And I think it's going to be really interesting, like the idea that, you know, they're going to be working with Rocket Pool, and it seems like that's going to be coming in maybe end of quarter one, but the Stakewise part of it might be coming as soon as middle of December when Stakewise version three goes live. So there's a really interesting ideas here that, like, you know, we weren't expecting to, to have Node set running like this soon, potentially, but um, it just shows that, you know, they're working really hard and they want to bring, um, they want to bring those, um, like staking on behalf of node set services 
to uh, node operators like as soon as possible and there's going to be a really nice opportunity for some node operators who are open to that to maximize their yield in a way that you won't be able to do in any other way. So, you know, you, that rocket pool node operator history, um, I think that's the fundamental part of it here. Um, I don't know if they're going, like, that, that's what it looks like, right? They're working with rocket pool node operators at the moment. Whether that mm -hmm. changes in the future, I don't know. But um, it seems like they're, they're really, um, like, expanding and doing some really interesting work out there. So yeah, it's, it's, really, it's, come out with. it's exciting. It's the, it's really a scaling solution for rock and mm -hmm. pool. And, you know, it reminds me of the, sh the, the share economy that we've got. We've got Airbnb, we've got Uber, you know, this idea is Airbnb. I have this extra room that it's, it sits vacant all year round, unless my in-laws come for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Well, why don't I, why don't I rent it out? I can, it, it's there. I might as well get more money. And with as a node operator, you have all this bandwidth on your node. Maybe you're running um, five validators. Well, your node, like these no these Nooks and Proteus machines, they can run hundreds of validators. You got all this extra space on your machine that's idle that you can kind of lease out and take in more and and be compensated for. It's a really nice setup. Um, I'm really excited with NodeSet and see what they can. This 2024 is going to be an explosive year, I think, for them. And, and I think Rocket Pool is going to benefit from it as well. Absolutely, yeah. Rocket Pool is going to benefit from it a lot because this is the next big staking um, uh, boom that I think is going to come for Rocket Pool. Um, you know, hopefully before the end of quarter one of 2024. Um, that will, I think, be a huge bonus for Rocket Pool's growth um, because we'll be able to accept ETH and RPL. And, you know, separately, which we can't do right now. So um, I'm really excited to see what these guys get up to. And I'm kind of cheering them on from the sidelines. So Yeah, me um, too. And job. the end of the first quarter just happens to be right around the time of ETH Denver. Uh, so maybe we'll have a, an announcement coming for the conference. Absolutely. Okay, WAC. Well, that concludes today's show. Thanks for listening, everyone, and watching. We appreciate you. Uh, none of this is financial advice. See you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.